good morning and welcome to, it's, it's still morning, right? A little bit later crowd, still hanging in there with morning time, I guess. We're not afternoon yet. Um, hey, I just want to do a couple of things as we get started. First, um, man, I got to walk in. We had a ton of rain yesterday, um, evening before yesterday, and uh, I got to walk in and I did not get my feet wet in the parking lot this morning, so that's something to celebrate. And I didn't get to point out to you, you can clap for that. I didn't get to point out to you before a couple of guys that were very instrumental in making that parking lot a reality. The first was Carl Lynch. Uh, He handles a a lot of our maintenance and cleaning and all the stuff that goes on here. And I think there's like 40,000 square feet in this facility. He deals with a lot. And so for several years now, he's been working on the parking lot project and has just been uh, a blessing in, in making all that happen. So if you see Carl Say, Carl, thank you that my feet are dry today. I'm really delighted. And the other is uh, another one of our members. His name is Eric Mayer. And he was just here throughout the whole process. Like, uh, that's kind of his background. And he was walking with the various contractors and just keeping his eyes on everything. And so also quite a blessing um, in, in terms of making sure that happens. So once again, you see those guys, please tell them thank you. Now, um, as we begin today, if you were not here last week, we started a new series called The Grace Effect, where we're looking at the New Testament book of Galatians. It is a small book in the middle of the New Testament, but has had a profound impact on our society at large. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that later. But at the heart of Galatians is, is getting the gospel right. I mean, the, the Apostle Paul wrote this gospel to really correct some misunderstanding that had crept in among the people in Galatia. And, and he's like, hey, you got to get this part right. Because wouldn't it be tragic, whether it be the Galatians or it be you and me, wouldn't it be tragic if we spent our entire lives believing something, maybe we're teaching it to our kids and we're sharing it with our neighbors, something that wasn't actually true. And that one day when we stand before God, we thought we had it all together, everything lined out only to find out that we were wrong. And so it's important that we as the church, and it's important that you as individuals clarify the gospel and get it right. Um, Did you know that you can be a minister, you can be a pastor, you can even be a priest and not have the gospel right? That is the story of a man named Martin Luther, now known as the father of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was born in 1490, uh, grew up and went to school. And one day on his way home from school, he gets caught in, this was Germany, but was probably one of those southeastern Oklahoma thunderstorms. You know, like it was, it was coming down to the extent that Luther, uh, he, w- he became terrified. There was lightning all around and he became convinced that he wasn't going to make it home from school on that day. And so he did that thing that many of you may have done. Uh, he prayed that prayer, God, if you get me out of this, I will serve you. I will follow you. And, and sure enough, God delivered Martin Luther. He did not get struck by lightning or drowned on that day. He made it home, and he kept his vow before God, which is pretty impressive, by the way. He's like, I'm going to enter the priesthood. And so he did. He became a Benedictine monk and a Catholic priest. He began um, studying all the things that you need to know a priest, serving in the Catholic church. Uh, But Martin Luther had a problem. He was completely miserable. He was at, at the point of despair. Um, And it was because he had this profound fear in his heart that he hadn't done enough. That even serving God with his life, it wasn't enough. And that ultimately, he would be rejected by God. And so, y'all, Luther took it seriously. He would be very fervent in prayer every single day. He was busy about the work of fasting, which we all know is next level Christianity, right? He was fasting before God, but that wasn't even enough for him. Um, When he would sin... When he'd fall into sin and do things that he didn't want to do, um, he would sleep on a cold stone floor and at times would beat himself with whips to show God that he was sorry. And he would spend hours in confession, laboring and trying to remember every possible sin because he believed that if he didn't confess every sin, that God wouldn't forgive it. And he became so miserable, in fact, that his confessor finally said, Hey, Martin, I think you need to start teaching the Bible. Now, you may not know this, but um, 15th, 16th century, uh, even priests did not read the Bible then. The Bible had only been translated into Latin, and so this is Germany, and and no one could read it. Common men did not have Bibles. Even the priests did not read the scriptures back then. 
Because Luther was so bad off, they said, well, maybe you ought to try reading the Bible. And he started with the Psalms. And he began to see God so differently than he ever had before. And then he made his way to Paul's epistles, or the letters that we have in the New Testament, and to Galatians. And for the first time in his life, Martin Luther came to faith in Jesus Christ as he realized that we are saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it completely transformed his entire life and his ministry. He went on to be the father of the Protestant Reformation because of what he learned in the Scriptures. He had finally got the gospel right, and it transformed transformed his life. Listen, y'all, I hope that that story is true for you too, that you have heard the true gospel, that you've gotten it right, you've understood it, and it has transformed your life. Like Christianity is not supposed to be a religion that we practice where you're like Luther and you're going through the motions and you're praying and you're fasting and hopefully you don't beat yourself with whips or whatever, but, but rather uh, the gospel is something that changes us and it makes us new and it changes our desires and our affections. It's not that we never struggle, but it is that we are made new. So it is important that we get the gospel right. If even a priest, if even a pastor uh, can not understand the gospel and not be saved, it might be true for some of us as well, people who might show up to church on a Sunday. And so we're going to look in Galatians. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 6. Now, I don't know if this ever happened to you when you were a kid, um, Maybe you, you came into the house and your mom greeted you rather than with a, hey, how you doing? Um, but she might say something like, I cannot believe. And you're like, oh, no, I know it's coming. I've gotten into some trouble. This is not going to be the friendly, warm conversation I had hoped for. You're going to see a little bit of that in this letter. Paul, he puts aside his usual greetings and, and nice, warm prayer, and he's just going to bring the heat from the beginning. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, I am, I'm in the wrong page, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you are turning to a different gospel. Now, I, I believe with all my heart that if we could go back to the, the church at Galatia, just travel back 2,000 years ago, and poll the people, they would say, and we were to ask them, hey, are you believing a different gospel? Are you deserting the one Jesus who called you by his grace? I think everyone in the church would have said, no. No, what are you even talking about? But Paul makes it clear, for us to embrace another gospel is to desert Jesus Christ himself. And that's why Paul is writing with such urgency. He knew what was at stake. And it wasn't just true for them. It's true for us as well. Like it is profoundly important that we get the gospel right. When he uses this word deserting here, it's a word that means to turn away or to transfer your allegiance. It was, it was actually used of a soldier who would have been in battle who would have left his company and his men and went to the other side to fight for the enemy. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Now, most of us, we want to be on Team Jesus, right? Like nobody was like, yeah, I think I want to be on the enemy's team. That'll be good for my life. And yet if we aren't careful, just like the Galatians, we might find that we have, have ended up in a place that we never intended to be. We've begun to believe a different gospel and deserted him who called us by his grace. Um, let me just spend a minute and clarify the gospel for you. The reason this was so important for the Apostle Paul is because he understood that if they were to desert Christ, there was no hope. There is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. The standard required for us to be in a right relationship with God, for us to be justified before God, the standard that is required for that is perfection. And the problem that we all have is every single one of us, we are imperfect. It's true of you, and it's surely true of me. The best person you know, the greatest example you can think of, falls short of the glory of God. God is perfectly holy in all of his ways, and as such, he cannot have fellowship with sin. In the same way that you can't have light and darkness coexisting, God can't have fellowship with sin. 
What God did not want to do is to cast us out or to just to, to judge the whole world due to sin. But instead, God sent his son, Jesus, who came and lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he went to the cross for us. There is a Savior. That's the good news. His name is Jesus. He came and lived that perfect, sinless life for us and then went to the cross to bear the just punishment that our sin deserved. My favorite passage in all of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says this, God made him, this is speaking of Jesus, God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so there's, there's kind of two things happening here in this exchange. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, what God does so graciously, what God does is he takes all of our sin, uh, sins of the past and the present, and even those future sins that we've yet to commit, and he transfers those to Jesus. And so as Jesus, he came, lived that perfect sinless life. He went to the cross. He was being crucified there. For those of us who had come to faith in Christ, God took our sins and he placed them on his son Jesus. And for the first time in the existence of Jesus, uh, he was separated from the Father. As he hung there, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God can't have fellowship with sin, right? And so God poured out his wrath against sin, the wrath that you and I deserve. He poured it out on his only begotten Son. And as he hung there, his final words were, It is Finished. And those are really good words for us. We should be delighted because we know that the just punishment for sin had been rendered. The work was done. The debt had been paid in full. And so our sins have been atoned for. But that's not the only thing that happened on the cross there. That's not the only thing that happened in, uh, in, in that exchange. Jesus took all of our sin, but then God took that righteous life of Jesus. And if you just remember, Jesus lived a perfect life that wasn't merely like I was kind of raised with, you don't drink and smoke and chew or go with girls that do. Jesus didn't just avoid those things that you learned in youth group when you were a kid, right? Jesus fulfilled every single point of the Jewish law, hundreds of them. He fulfilled them Perfectly, Every law, every command was fulfilled completely. Jesus loved his neighbor as himself fully. He loved the Lord as God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He didn't just avoid bad things. He did all of the good things that we have been called to do. He was perfectly righteous. And when we come to faith in Jesus, God doesn't just take our sin and give it to Jesus. He takes his righteousness and he credits that to our Account. So when God looks at you and God looks at me, thank Jesus, he doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see my past. He doesn't see my brokenness and my failures. He doesn't see that moment that I so deeply regret. He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Do you remember when uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist? The Jordan River and, uh, you know, the, the Spirit descends upon him like a dove and there's a voice from heaven and then God says this about Jesus. He says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can I tell you something? Jesus is not disappointed in you. God is not looking at you wishing you would get your life together, wishing that you could finally take a few steps and mature a little bit, begin to live a little bit better. When God looks at you, he's not, he doesn't feel frustrated, he doesn't feel disappointed. He feels love. Jesus Christ took the curse, our sin deserved, right? He bore that on the cross. He took our curse so that we could bear his blessing. When God looks at you, he sees his son and he sees his daughter with whom he is well pleased. He delights in us. God rejoices in his children in the same way that we delight and rejoice in our own children. As a matter of fact, you need to know this about you. There is nothing you could ever do or not do that would make God more pleased or make you more acceptable to him than you already are right now. You have been clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And, and here's the thing about perfection. You can't improve upon that. Jesus kept every law, fulfilled every commandment, avoided every sinful thing in this, in this world. His righteousness is perfect. And that's what we've been clothed in by faith. Man, 
That's a joy, isn't it? That is the gospel. Now, for the Galatians, they had people coming in and saying, hey, you're saved by faith in Jesus, but you need to observe the Sabbath. You need to practice circumcision. You need to celebrate the various feasts and festivals. You need to keep certain components of the law in order to be acceptable to God. The true gospel tells us that there is nothing we could ever do to make ourselves more pleasing to God than we are now. For those of us who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, they, they lay it out for us. They say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is God's grace. It's that gift, right? And then he wants to be really clear of what does not save us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, right? This isn't your works. This isn't your goodness. This isn't your righteousness. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Man, as believers, we come together unified by this idea that Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. He is the one who has done all of the work on our behalf. We are merely recipients of his undeserved grace. Listen, God's favor isn't given as a result of our works. We, we couldn't have earned his favor. We certainly didn't deserve it. But Jesus has freely given it. His righteousness was perfect. And you can't improve upon that perfection. And so we get to rest in the Father, in what He has done for us. Several years ago, well, it's been a lot of years ago now, uh, my wife and I got engaged. And we decided to make the very wise move of uh, going through Dave Ramsey's financial peace pre-marriage. Uh, we did not know how difficult it was to merge two lives together. Um, I, I had my money, she had hers, you know, and, and then suddenly we're going to get married and merge those things together. But I remember one of the things that we learned in the class, Dave Ramsey would say it over and over and over on the videos. He would quote Proverbs 22, 7, which says that the borrower is slave to the lender. Y'all, anyone, y'all been through financial peace? Y'all know this, Right. And there was this really interesting song that he would sing to describe the relationship between many Americans and, and debt and their, their jobs. He was actually quoting Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And he, he would sing the song, I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go, right? We got to pay those bills because we're in debt. And listen, I don't think that that little catchy line just describes the relationship between Americans and their debt and their job. I think many people feel that way before God. Because we've sinned against him. Because even after we came to faith in Jesus, you might have had a moment like Luther where, where Jesus saved you and you're like, God, I'm going to serve you forever. I'm going to give you my whole life. I'm never going back to that sin again. Like, I'm done with I'm going to serve you with my whole life. And maybe you meant it. But then somewhere along the way, you stumbled and you fell back into that old sin some of those old patterns, and suddenly you felt like you owed God something again. You're like, Jesus, I promised I would, I would, I would serve you, but I'm not serving you very well. Uh, God, I feel like I failed you. And you, you start trying to make it up to him. You're like, I'm going to church. I'm hitting two services on Sunday. I know what I did on Friday. I got to make it up to God. We become this I owe, I owe. It's off to work I go. And we start relating to God in that way. But listen, God is not a shrewd lender who only lends his grace to people that can faithfully repay him. And God is a gracious father who extends grace to people who do not deserve it and could never earn it. Have you all read the story of the, the prodigal son? Luke chapter 15 is a beautiful story that starts a little rough on the front end. It's, it's kind of painful. It's, it's a young son coming to his father and man, it's, he wants to go do some living. He wants to go do his thing. And so he comes to his father and he demands that his father gives him his share of the estate. He wanted to go do something else. And so the father does. He gives him the money, his share of the estate. And the son, he goes off to a distant country and he begins to squander the wealth on wild living. And it must have been some pretty good wild living because word got back to the father, right? He knew there were some things going down even though the son was in a distant land. After time, the famine hits the land, and that son finds himself, he's hard up. He doesn't have money to feed himself. He's blown all of his wealth. He's squandered what his father had worked so hard for. And he hires himself out to a farmer, 
and he is so bad off that he's feeding pigs one day. I don't know if y'all have seen what pigs eat, but it's usually not very desirable. But he finds himself envying. He longs to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He thinks, you know what? Man, the servants in my father's house are eating better than I do. I'm going to go back home. And I'll just, I'll come back as a servant. My father doesn't owe me anything. And I don't deserve to be called a son anymore. I'll just come back as a slave. But as the story goes, and Jesus is the one telling us, when the son is still a long way away, the father, who has been looking for his son, he spots him while he's a long way off. And he runs to his son. And he throws his arms around him. And he kisses him on the cheek. And he, he tells his servants, hey, bring the finest robe. Bring some sandals to put on his feet. Bring a ring to put on his finger. For my son was lost. And he has returned home. And the, the father just lavishes all that is his on his son. I mean, he calls the friends and family. And they have a, a big old party on that day to celebrate that his son has come home. Listen, that, that ring that he put on his finger... It signified not that he was a slave or a servant. It signified that he was a son who now carried all the authority of the father. Like he could go out and transact business and enjoy the benefits of his father's kingdom once again. And that's the story for us too. Many of us, when we fall into sin, we think, well, I can come back to God as a slave. Maybe I can kind of earn my way back into his good graces. But the Father is the one who just desires for us to come home to enjoy fellowship with the Father and the riches of his kingdom. We are not earners. And we are, we are the recipients of the gift of God's grace. It is really, really important that we get the gospel right so that we don't relate to God in the wrong way. We don't relate to God as slaves rather than as sons and his daughters. There's, there's two things that I want to point out for you in this passage before we go today. And then a couple of responses to those things. Uh, the first is this. And I, I've said it a few times already. Um, the first is that there is a true gospel. And it is imperative that we get it right. Now, because Paul, three times in this text, if you'll read it, he points out, he uses three different words for a false gospel. He calls it a, a contrary gospel or a, a distorted gospel, one which is contrary to what he has been teaching. It's a false or a distorted gospel. Now, the fact that Paul points out that there are counterfeits, there are false gospels, tells us that there is also so a true gospel. And we live in a day in which people don't like to be told what is true and not true, right? We all want to have our own truth, kind of make our own way, decide what is good and right and true for us. And, and listen, if that's the life you live, okay. We can either speculate about what is good and right and true, or we can look at God's revelation of what is good and right and true. And God has graciously given us his word to tell us what is true. Now, would it be tragic to get to the end of your life, to buy into kind of postmodern thought that says you get to tell other people what's true, you can live your own truth. Wouldn't it be tragic to get to the end of your own life and realize that you believe something to be true that wasn't? Or you taught your kids to believe something to be true that ultimately wasn't? Man, this, this is important. Now, wouldn't it be a tragedy if we as the church did all that we do here. I mean, we got three services on Sunday. We're, we're here on Wednesday. Tuesday night, we're doing regeneration. We have re-engaged as our marriage ministry. We have community groups meeting all across this city. Student ministry stuff going on. We're planting a church in Madrid. We're connected with half a dozen mission partners all around the world. Wouldn't it be tragic if we were just peddling a false gospel? I mean, telling people something was true that ultimately wasn't? I thought about this over the weekend, and it's, it's like, uh, I don't know if you all know how hot it was, and it's going to be this afternoon, right, one of those brutal high humidity days. Imagine if a hiker got lost and showed up to your house. I mean, they're just dying of thirst. They find their way out of the wilderness, and they show up at your door, and you can tell they're just absolutely parched. Now, how sad would it be if you went and drew water out of a poisoned well to give to them? And rather than getting them that which would give them life and renew and restore them, you gave something that was going to leave them worse off than they were before. There is a true gospel, and it is imperative that we get it right. We are God's church. We are his representatives to the world. We need to get the gospel right. 
The second thing here, there is a true gospel. It's imperative that we get it right. The second thing I want you to see is there will be false teachers, and we must be careful to discern them. Now, most of us don't sit around thinking, I'm going to be duped. I'm going to be led astray. Most of us look around, and anyone who disagrees with us, we're like, Psh. They clearly don't get it, right? They're wrong, and I'm right. Very few people think, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get led astray. But do you know how you get moved from, a false, or from the true gospel to a false one? It's the same way that you eat an element, an elephant, one bite at a time, one small step at a time, buying into some of the lies that the enemy might be selling. Paul wants us to know that there are false teachers out there. In verse 7, he says, Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you, and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. He's going to go on to repeat that again. He's like, if it's me, if it's an angel from heaven, let the person who preaches the false gospel, another gospel, be accursed. That word, it means condemned. What Paul is saying is let me spend eternity in hell if I'm going to preach to you a false gospel. Now, as Americans, we kind of like our personalities, don't we? We like our people that we can talk about. Uh, my son, Luke, he wears soccer jerseys. He has one for every day of the week. Whether they're clean or not, he's going to wear them, right? He loves his soccer personalities. And maybe for you, you have people in your life that you follow. My daughter is a Swifty. There's lots of Taylor Swift going on in my house and in my vehicles. I swear it's not for me, right? I, I mean, maybe for you, you have people that you follow in your life. Maybe you're like a Rogan fan, listen to, you know, Spotify, or you follow the Kardashians, or maybe you like those daggum politicians. Like, there's somebody that you're following in your life. And listen, it's, it's okay to have people that you listen to and, and people that you like, or even people that you admire their talents. But we have to be careful about the people that we allow to influence us. Paul tells us this is critical. He's like... I am the Apostle Paul. If I deliver a, a false gospel, let me be accursed. For many of us, we've had people that have spoken into our lives that we admire and we trust. Maybe it's like that grandma or that grandpa that poured into your life or took you to church or that neighbor who was really kind and compassionate or the, the guy that you're listening to online that seems to be so caring and, and laying things out in a way that makes sense to you. Listen, care or charisma or, or talent or whatever, it, it doesn't necessarily make what the person is saying is true. Like, it is important for us to look and, and to, to distinguish between a true gospel and a false gospel. We can be led astray just like anyone else could, and we would be foolish to think that it couldn't happen to us, I think, the Galatians would have been like, no, not us. No, we're solid, man. The Apostle Paul delivered the gospel to us. We got this down. Now, I want you to imagine uh, you go home today and an angel appears to you at your house. Never happened to me, but I'm, I'm still holding out hope, right? I mean, uh, this is what happened when, when, to Mary when she, she was told by an angel, like, hey, you're, you're carrying the Savior of the world. That's a big moment in your life. I don't care who you are. An angel appears, that's a top ten, right? In your life, no matter what it is, that's a big deal. And I would want to listen to what the angel had to say. Paul says, even if an angel shows up to you, as a matter of fact, he clarifies in 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Charisma, someone who speaks so clearly and so well and makes such good sense, it doesn't make them right. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Did you know that Muslims believe what they believe based upon Muhammad saying an angel had appeared to him? Did you know that Mormons believe that an angel appeared to Joseph Smith, and, and as such they believe that one day they're, they're going to get their own planet. Like, that's what, it was an angel. And the Apostle Paul, 2,000 years ago, was pointing this out to us. That if I or even an angel comes and tells you another gospel, let him be accursed. There will be false teachers, and we have to be careful to discern them. Do you know how to tell if someone's a true or a false teacher? By the gospel that they proclaim. Does it put the spotlight on man and his works, or does it put the spotlight on Jesus and his finished work for us? Do they proclaim that Jesus is Lord? Do they exalt Christ rather than men? Do they tell us that we are saved by God's grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ 
alone. That's a simple little statement, but it is hard for us to grasp deep in our souls. All right, so what do we do about this? We know there are false teachers. There's a true gospel. We need to get it right. There's false teachers out there. How do we keep from being led astray? Um, Number one, we have to know God's word. And we have to know God's word word. There's, if, if you pay attention to things online, watch YouTube videos, even if you watch the Discovery Channel, some of that old stuff, you know, there's a lot of debate about the, rather, whether or not the Bible that we have is accurate. And you're going to see all sorts of, of arguments. Well, let me just say this to you. Uh, among all the manuscripts we have of the original language and all that, they are in 99% agreement between them. If you were to look throughout history at, at the copies that we have of the Greek text or whatever it might be, you actually will find a mistake every now and then, which means a scribe was, was copying, right, by hand because they didn't have a printing press, and he messed up. He made a mistake on a vowel. And do you know how he made a mistake? Because there are dozens of other manuscripts that got it right, okay? Um, literally 99% of all the manuscripts that we have of the original text are in agreement with one another. You can have a lot of confidence that what you read in the Bible is true. But you know what? That whole argument over the reliability of scriptures and whether or not there are changes, it's kind of a silly argument if we never take time to read the Bible as it is. And if we don't take time to be in the Word and to know what is true, it's pretty easy for us to believe something that is false. Like We need to know what is good and right and true from the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable for us for teaching and for reproof and for correction. You may not need it, but I do at times. For correction and training in righteousness so that we as the men and women of God may be complete and ready for every good work. And one of the things that we encourage you to do over and over and over is to devote yourselves daily to God. Get up every day and spend time in the Word. If the Bible feels a little bit overwhelming to you, welcome to the club. You're probably not going to become an expert in a month. But if you'll devote daily today and tomorrow, and you'll do that for a week, and then you'll do that for a month, which will turn into year, a year, and then it will turn into years, man, you can come to know the Word of God and have a really great grasp of what is good and right and true. Number one, we have to know the Word of God. And the second thing, and this one may be even more challenging to you, we have to belong to His church. There is a foolish and arrogant idea in our culture that as Christians that we don't need the church. You might hear this said, you know, I love God, but I just, I'm not a big fan of His church. Listen, the church is the bride of Christ. It is made up of men and women who have been saved by Jesus. And now who is the bride of Christ? We, we now represent Jesus. It, I'll say it this way. If you belong to Jesus, you should belong to his church. That was his intention for you. And yet many people are like, yeah, I don't really need it. The scriptures describe the church as a body with many parts. And, you know, we got hands and ears and various pieces of our body. And The scriptures tell us that we all need each other. We're interdependent upon one another. Which means if you are trying to live out your faith separate from the church, you're not going to get very far in your faith. And you need a body to support and to encourage and to help you. When, when I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of channels. We actually had the channel, um, and we reminded our parents of that a lot. But one of the programs that would come on was National Geographic Discovery. I don't know if you all remember these shows, um, but here's the plot line for almost every episode. The predator gets the prey. Over and over and over, it was this story. And, you know, maybe in one particular episode, the, the narrator, who was very serious and loved his job, would describe the cheetah as he is approaching the prey. And he had this re- really unique accident and there, the accent, and there was a big herd of wildebeest, which I didn't know what they were until I watched that show, but I, I learned what a wildebeest was. But it was this, this cheetah or, or whatever it was, and it would be creeping up on this massive herd of wildebeest. And, and you know, it was very dramatic, and there would be music that was, you know, coming as the moment happened where the cheetah sprung into action and he went and he hunted down one of those wildebeest uh, in order to slaughter it. It's a weird thing to watch as a kid, but I did over and over and over. Um, And I was young back then, but even as a kid, it didn't take me long to come to understand that the animal that gets separated from the herd was the one that gets devoured. It happened over and over and over. And you know what? 
I've been a part of the church for a long time, and it didn't take me that long to figure that out for us as well. It is true of wildebeest on the National Geographic programs, and it's true for people in the church. If you get isolated, if you can get separated from the herd, the enemy will devour you. So I just want to encourage you, belong to the church of Jesus Christ as your pastor. Can I just encourage you not to just merely attend here, but belong to this church. Invest yourself in this church Become a member. Let other people know that this is your church and that you're committed to them and need them to be committed to you. And get in a small group of it with people who know you well enough to call you on your junk. We, we don't like this as Americans. Like, I don't want anyone telling me how to live. But we really need that. Because it's easy to deceive ourselves and to pretend like we got everything going right and we know what's best. You know, the word was given to correct us at times. And the church was given, not merely to correct, we encourage, we build one another up most of the time. But every now and then, we need someone to step in and say, hey, you're getting off track here. So what do we do in a world that desperately needs the gospel, but it's easy to be perverted because there are false teachers? And we know God's word and we belong to his church. Man, my hope is that we can continue on. God's doing great things in and through our church, and I pray that that only continues. I believe we're just seeing the beginning of what God is going to do through us. But we got to get the gospel right. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the gospel that finds us wanting, that finds us in need, that finds us hopeless and helpless to save ourselves. And yet, God, you're not a God who demands that if we're going to be recipients of grace, we got to work off this debt. But rather, you're a loving Father who so kindly and graciously and lovingly gives us your grace that we don't deserve. And God, you draw us into a relationship with you that transforms us. And you teach us what is true and what is abundant life. Lord, I pray that in this church we may we might hold up the right and true gospel and we might proclaim you faithfully. We pray that you would continue to work in us and through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, we're going to have a time of...